so I'd like to welcome you all to the Athena and the, the Development Research and Project Center uh, DRPC dissemination event of the Women's um, Economic Empowerment in Nigeria report as a part of uh, the Partnership for Advancing Women in Economic Development uh, Powered Project. The essence of this event is to uh, share information on the current state of women's economic empowerment in Nigeria, um, initiate conversations with stakeholders on how to design program for women's economic empowerment, as well as highlight the opportunities for women's economic empowerment to foster household and national economic prosperity. Women's issues are not just a gender challenge their economic development challenge because um, when women are affected, either financially or anyway, uh, the economy as a whole is affected. About 50% of our population is made up of women. Uh, women of adult population over the age of 18 years in Nigeria is about 53 million. What that means is that investing in this population presents big opportunities for us. And most importantly, big opportunities to achieve the sustainable development goal. We um, would also realize that 33% of uh, women within this population are almost business owners. And that presents a unique opportunity either from MSME, SMEs, or large uh, businesses. And uh, from World Bank data to African Union data, it's always been shown that when we invest in women, the chances are that the community and the family will benefit much more from it. But what does the reality on the ground look like? A lot of women who need the opportunity, access to finance, do not have it. Many of them do not have access to pension, they do not have access to insurance, and they do not have bank account. What this already means is that it limits their opportunity to reach their full potential. But we can change the narrative, and this is a starting point, leveraging on data to create remarkable results. That's why we are happy to be doing what we are doing with uh, the RPC to accelerate the impact of uh, investment in women's work. Let me start, you know, on uh, behalf, you know, of the government, you know, of Nigeria to to commend, you know, the effort of uh, the RPC, you know, for catalyzing the implementation of a uh, useful you know women economic uh, policies programs and projects in nigeria and permit me to say that uh, the government of nigeria the current administration has uh, made you know also several efforts you know over the years to to provide you know an impetus you know in uh, ensuring that uh, women uh, economic empowerment you know is on the front uh, burner of the government and this uh, as part of this effort you know during the post covid or after the post covid you know era the government you know put up a economic sustainability plan stimulus package you know of about 2.3 you know trillion and uh, the government ensured that uh, the whole you know content you know of that uh, stimulus plan you know was engendered uh, our next speaker uh, dr tommy eramosele will be providing insights into um the the we report context we're looking into we now looking at the adult female po population in nigeria and looking at the various domains that we have selected um just the first around skills around you know the resource that the woman has we see that the you know um the nigerian woman woman is likely to live in a rural area 61 percent of them live in rural areas um one in two, one out of two have not attained secondary education um about 32 percent are dependent so they're dependent on someone else for their main source of income and one third also earn less than 15,000 naira a month. 
this is interesting information because this has implication for financial inclusion uh, or i would say for their you know their op uptake and use of financial services as well as for their economic empowerment for for the government we are calling on uh, you know the government to design um policies that are gender rep responsive invest in women economic empowerment initiatives and improve allocation to gender responsive budgeting so um we should adopt the gender lens in things we do and not just in terms of um how they are designed but also in how they are implemented um having taken a deep dive into the we report let's hear what our distinguished uh panelists have to say about the challenges uh faced by stakeholders in implementing we initiatives in nigeria and how inclusive finance can improve uh we um, if i can please start with mr zino from the from women's world banking how should inclusive finance be embedded um, as a key feature of interventions that seek to promote we something else to consider with regard to embedding inclusive finance is the potential for product bundling and what that means is you want to for example avail women with credit but is it possible to bundle that credit offering with another solution probably savings could there be some connection whereby you can incentivize women to save and because of good savings behavior they now have access to credit and what quantities of credit do you avail in what form do you avail the credit is it just cash is it in electronic form is it in kind instead of in cash those are some considerations which could move the needle and ensure that in uh, the, the way we engage with low-income women we take into consideration their unique circumstances and make sure that it gets to them the way they want it and when they need it i would go to barrister vera what does economic empowerment mean for an average nigerian woman um what economic empowerment means to the women is the ability to be able to take, make decisions for themselves ability to increase their economic and uh, um, power power to be able to decide on what to do, take decisions in the home, to grow their wealth, to be able to send their children to school and so on. Power to dignity of life. That is what basically economic empowerment means to a woman. Power to own property. Power to be able to decide on their economic, take economic decisions in home. And talking about um, between the north and the south, there's, indeed there's a great disparity. In the South, women are encouraged. We know that women are historically and naturally created to, to uh, intelligent and created to do menial jobs. They have the experience to be involved in subsistence uh, subsisten activities, economic activities that are informal. We discover that mostly in the South, women are allowed to take part in many activities, entrepreneurial activities. While in the North, you are caged, you don't have a say. You cannot take decisions on your own. You have to take permission. You are generally believed that you are a woman, you should be kept indoors. You have to be seen and not to be heard. So we discover that even the level of poverty is different between the woman in the South and the woman in the North. This current administration um, has invested in women's economic empowerment. So I'll go come to Dr. Zakaria now just to get what are some of the initiatives um, or what's the vision of the government in terms of women's economic empowerment? What are some of the initiatives that you are working on? And um, based on learn learnings, right, um, from ongoing initiatives and, and new data as well, what are some of the changes or initiatives that we should look forward to? The government uh, has uh, really considered, you know, the issue of women economic, you know, empowerment as a very critical uh, factor in development, and uh, has has put and is putting, you know, a lot of initiatives to ensure that uh, the women are economically empowered. And one critical thing that it did was. You, I believe you are all aware that we have a medium-term national uh, 
development plan. The plan, you know, from uh, that uh, is conceptualized, you know, to drive development between 2021 to 2025. This is the copy, you know, of that plan. It is online, you know, you can all go through it. And one thing that, you know, we did differently, you know, in this plan is to ensure that, uh, you know, the plan, you know, is driven by women. The chair, you know, of uh, the steering committee, you know, of this plan, you know, was a, is a you know, was a woman, the Minister of uh, National Planning, Hajia Dr. Zainab Shamsuna Ahmad, you know, and uh, is co-chaired anyway by the private sector. But from the government side, you know, you know, it is driven by a woman. And then the technical committee also, you know, that uh, drive this plan was also, you know, the Dr. Sarah Alade, who is also a woman, a retired, you know, CBN director. So they give direction to the plan and we ensure that, you know, the whole content, you know, has ensured that, you know, women have not been changed in the strategies and the process, you know, of the delivery of the plan. You know, priorities and everything, you know, is, is engendered in such a way that, you know, women are deliberately targeted. And as I told you, even the driving of that plan, you know, was done, was basically, you know, driven by women to ensure that, you know, their interests is fully protected. So these are some of the initiatives among others. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Zakaria. Um, that's um, useful information to, to know. Um, I will go to Sophie, Sophie Abu, who is the head of the gender desk at the CBN, um, Financial Inclusion Delivery Unit at the CBN. Um, what are some of the relevant CBN initiatives that support we um, and how successful have these initiatives been? Um, we have a national financial inclusion strategy. Um, which was launched um, sometime in 2012, revised in 2018, and also trying to be sort of um, revised again for 2021 to 2024. Now, in that strategy, um, women have been identified as a critical, vulnerable segment that must be addressed if we're to achieve the national goal of 95% financial inclusion by 2024. Um, having said that, um, you know, a lot of the interventions that we have at the Central Bank of Nigeria are very gender um, inclusive, as it were. I'll give the example of the Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Development Fund that was launched um, sometime in 2011 or 2012. That fund, even as we were developing the guideline, was established that 60% of the funds should go to women entrepreneurs and, you know, women groups. Um, in the country. A couple of other interventions like the targeted credit facility, um, which was um, launched at the time when COVID was just starting to affect businesses and households. Um, while not stated per, per se in that guideline that, you know, there was no particular number that should go to women. As we're getting reports on the people who have benefited and accessed those funds, I can tell you that over 45% of the total number of beneficiaries in that fund are currently women. Um, and it's the same across a lot of our interventions. What we do at the central bank is that even as we engage with the beneficiaries, even as we engage with banks, you know, to reach out to clients who will access those funds through the institutions, we ensure that women are given priority, um, especially, you know, after eligibility criteria and all of that have been established. Now, the most recent thing that we've done at the central bank of Nigeria is go ahead to develop and launch what we call a framework for advancing women's financial financial inclusion in Nigeria. Um, that framework has worked through understanding a lot of the data that Afina has put out as well as other research that has been conducted to identify that in Nigeria, as you know, we have an 8% gap in access to finance, 8% gender gap. Um, and so for us, it is very critical. Now, 8%, we all know that is the high level um, sort of national average. But when you start to drill down to other states, you drill down to states in the north, you realize that the gap in access to finance starts to get a lot wider. And so we are dedicated and committed to ensuring that through this framework for advancing women's financial inclusion, we're able to work through developing policies, um, engaging with operators and financial services providers to ensure that they're coming up with tailored products for women. 
um, working with um, civil societies and, and women's groups to ensure that we're doing adequate um, information dissemination, financial awareness and inclusion, um, and just to ensure that we're giving women the opportunity to access resources that we've spoken about to be able to be properly empowered when it comes to um, um, economic empowerment. Can I quickly go to Uzoma, um, CEO of Sparkle? There's empirical evidence that shows that beyond access, expanding access to finance, digital financial services actually advances women's economic empowerment. So what did banks do in that time? They went to so the they leverage on mobile first. first there was ATM, but that wasn't the real enabler. And they now um, leverage on mobile mobile telephony to take banking to the people in the marketplace. And you saw a big upsurge in in in, in uptake. But of course, the, the, the other barriers that you saw that, that they exist is understanding how to use um, these technologies to um, to um, go about the daily life. I, I, we don't focus on the financial in, financial inclusion. We focus on that social. First of all, what are those key ingredients? One, access to that device, smartphone. Secondly, social inclusion. Right, and social inclusion is identity. You will now identify this into this community. And the third one is, are things like information to take decisions, to say yes, to say no. And without that, without without all that, everything will fall apart. Everything is not sustainable. So technology is great, but you must understand what is, first of all, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to change people's life or are we trying to use it to enhance something that's actually really working? Because from, from the um, from the report, 44% of these women are actually in business. Now, how do we make it better for them? 77% already have smartphones. Now, how do we actually help them to leverage that whether it is actually social inclusion, whether it actually enhanced financial inclusion or other solutions that will actually help them. I mean, there's one, one question we want to ask to, to Barista Vera. How should financial service providers partner with, how can they partner with, with the collectives to support women's economic empowerment? Um, there are a whole lot of ways. The government, financial service providers, regulators can partner with uh, we collectives in improving women inclusive uh, funding. We know that, um, that um, women are critical to development. The empowerment of women is very, very critical to the development and um, sustainability of any nation. Therefore, we would like the government, financial service providers, regulators, to prioritize women economic empowerment as part of their policy priority. We also appreciate if the lump sum of empowerment budget, just like we heard from the DEX officers in CBN has said they have a lot of budget for we, not we essentially for economic empowerment. We appreciate it if such budget is sex disaggregated to be able to ascertain how well women will benefit we also advise that land ownership for women farmers should be encouraged. Increase in the number of women engaged in income generating activities in the nation should also be encouraged. And not forgetting adequate, adequate and timely release of funds for women economic empowerment to ensure that more women as individuals and groups can assess necessary funding to improve their socioeconomic well-being and contribute effectively to the stated economy. We also know that if financial education is encouraged, that things will move on better, uh, women will adequately be included. Evidence from the literature, from the papers that have been pre presented, have shown that educating women and financial literacy will encourage more women into the financial system. Financial supervisors and regulators across the nation should put in place policies and strategies that will provide financial awareness to the women. And such policies must be flexible in such a way that it can be adjusted in different ge ge geographical locations. We also think that 
if provision of adequate credit facility is provided, we will be halfway through this problem. Financial supervisors and regulators should ensure that women have unfiltered access to credit facilities in order to encourage them to open accounts with banks. Like uh, Spaco have just said, we will still need the old generation bank. We will still need to use what is been what is in place apart from fintech. However, the facility should be flexible. It should be made accessible to women, and a certain percentage of development funds would be set aside for enhancing female empowerment. Additionally, appropriate and um, appropriate policy legal regulatory and supervisory frameworks should be developed and employed to support the provision of credit and other financial products and services to women. And then permit me to go back to what Dr. Zakaria said earlier on and then the Dex officer of CBN. It is true that um, a lot of um, fundings have been earmarked for we in Nigeria. We hear a lot of money. But how what is the impact of this funding? How, how, what is the impact on we in Nigeria? What is the assessment? Uh, assessment Have they assessed the impact on women? We are on the ground. We work with the grassroots women. And I can tell you that most of these projects do not have prerequisite and demonstration uh, uh, impact with the amount that has been released on funding. Yes, the funding has been released, but because of lack of monitoring and evaluation the impact of these funds have not been adequately assessed or uh, assessed properly so therefore i would like to advise that um, technical working group should be set up to evaluate monitor and report on all these three activities and let me use this opportunity to also congratulate power due to their efforts in bringing together champions, stakeholders, we collectives who worked for months, almost over a year. And the um, instrument, my instrument was launched by the Minister of, um, Minister of um, Budget and National Planning. It's, I think about two or three weeks ago. So if this uh, instrument is not just kept in the shape, I believe from here, we can start up and things will begin to take shape. Not for us to just be hearing that there are fundings that are there, fundings have been released, and uh, there are projects on women, but the women themselves cannot assess this funding. The women themselves are not even aware of this. But I believe if the stakeholders and all this will work with the women collectives, work with the women collectives, because on that power, which I, I happen to humbly be the national coordinator, we'll be able, we have over 50. Over 50 we collectives, we have them. We are over 50 different NGOs that deal with we in Nigeria. So if they can work with us, we'll be able to disseminate this information. We'll be able to, to bring our own quota in assessing and monitoring these projects. And even in data collection, we will even let the government and the stakeholders know the project that is best suited for any region of the country, the project that is best suited for the women. Because I tell you, the project that is suited for the women in Niger State may not be the same project that is suited for the women in Ekiti State. So we need to, to, to work with the government, the financial service providers, the regulators, and the NDAs to, to mark and know so that the government will not continuously shoot in the dark. Because most of these projects are like projects that are that that are just executed without proper and deliberate uh, uh, data collection or inquiry to know what is best for the women there. So the women know what they want. The women know where it pinches. If they can work with the, the coalition, I believe that things will be better done. My question is actually to Powered. Uh, it's interesting that we now know that 70 million Nigerian women over this percentage have access to mobile phones. We also now know that there is need to up our gains in, uh, in the area of financial literacy. 
Now, my question is to Powered. How do Powered intend to take advantage of all of this to facilitate um, better knowledge for Nigerian women who are into businesses? Because I'm aware that uh, Awita is a member of uh, Powered. How do they intend to incorporate Nigerian women into all of these statistics, ensuring that they become more empowered? They get more funds for their businesses. They get more education on how to get the funds. So how do we think that we can achieve this? Awita is one of the NGOs, we collectives in our uh, associ association. What, what I said earlier on, we have over 50. And when we meet, we discuss this issue. Well, what is required of us is to go back to our primary associations. Like I am the national president of Nigerian Association of Women Entrepreneurs. So it behoves on me to always go back to my association and give them feedback from what is being done. We cannot bring everybody under one, uh, under, uh, under one roof. So we the representatives, we are just representatives. We have to go back to disseminate uh, the such information. And I know that uh, amongst us, we have journalists. Um, in not too distant part, Powered had them um, Pali, I think a five days Pali with journalists that report on we activities in Nigeria. They were trained on how to report we activities. And I know that they've been doing that. And then we also work with stakeholders. We have champions. We have members from different NDAs and uh, ministries, parasitas, and, and, and so on, that we work together, we come together, fashion things, and then we are expected to go back, both on the government side and on the, uh, on the stakeholder side, to pass back the information. Yeah, we'll jump to um, Sophia from um, CBN to give your final thoughts. And there's also a comment, a question around um, how do we account for persons with disabilities? Sophia, I know that um, as part of your role, you also have a working group who is looking into that. So as part of your closing statement, if you could also just touch on, on um, you know, what, 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 what we're doing for that, for that um, target group as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Tommy, and thank you to all the other speakers. A lot has been said already around the importance of being able to monitor um, the impact of the interventions that um, are out there for women. I absolutely agree. Um, I think it's critical. Internally at the CBN, what we do is ensure that we are tracking disbursements, right? Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you set out um, funds for a group of people, you do want to ensure that those funds are reaching those people. Um, so I do understand as well that um, there are challenges as it relates to to reach, um, um, I think the rep of the Women's um, Entrepreneur uh, Association had highlighted that it was important to work with them to be able to reach as many women as possible. I think there's also something to be said for um, ensuring that the women groups who these funds or interventions are targeted for are also eligible. Right? So there must be a lot of work done at communal levels by the associations to ensure that you are working together with these women so that at the end of the day, when the financial institution who is giving out these funds, which must do their due diligence, um, is trying to reach women, the women are actually able and eligible to access the funds. So I think that's a, a very important thing to put out there. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to note was in terms of, we're very excited to hear about the monitoring and evaluation framework, uh, and we're happy to work with um, the government to ensure that that is being done so that we as well would like to know the impact of our interventions on livelihoods um, you know, of these women. I think the last question you raised around persons with disabilities is something that we're also working on. Um, like Tommy had mentioned, we um, have a special interventions working group um, that caters to um, issues surrounding women, youth, and persons with disabilities as it relates to their ability to access finance, as it relates to their ability to even be eligible um, for opportunities that are available. Um, that working group um, meets quarterly uh, and usually we have already um, engaged with several groups. We used to work, I think, with the Joint National Association of Persons with Disabilities. We're trying to see how we can even engage um, a specific focus group of women with disabilities so that we're providing awareness, we're providing um, opportunities and availability of the things that um, are, are uh, 
are available for them. Well, I hope our participants got a lot of learning from the discussions as I did. Uh, a profound thanks and gratitude to all our esteemed panelists and uh, the moderator. Great insights and contributions shared during that session. So um, on behalf of Efina and uh, our partner, DRPC, who are the organizers of the Powered um, Activities, we say a very big thank you to all of you, our panelists, members of the audience, all who ask questions, the keynote um, speaker, Dr. Zachary, and also our CEO who made our time to open this um, event. We thank everyone uh, for making this uh, a, a success. Mm -hmm.